Okay, I think we'll get started. It's, uh, it's 12 o'clock. Um, I'm not Barry Kassin, um, but he's asked me to do, uh, introduce our guest uh, today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Don Sin. I'm the interim VP of research at this great institution. Um, so I, I see that we have a very good crowd here and el elsewhere. So it's clearly the uh, guest speaker that brings out the crowd. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Um, some of you may know uh, Sabrina, some of you may not know Sabrina. Um, so she was re new, uh, recently recruited to uh, run this, the laboratory at CFE. So there is a virology laboratory that's, uh, that's associated with the Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS, and uh, Sabrina runs uh, a, a, a very, very uh, good uh, service and a good lab there. She, her ac academic appointment is at SFU. She joined SFU in 2009. Prior to that, uh, she graduated from UBC in experimental medicine P with a PhD and went to uh, Harvard and MIT to do her postdoc. Um, she's one of the high flyers at the Faculty of Health Sciences uh, at Simon Fraser. I, I know that because I've talked to her dean, and she's very happy to have her uh, in her faculty and put up the SFU flag. Um, so Sabrina is an expert in HIV, uh, molecular biology of HIV, and particularly her interest is in how HIV adapts and evolves to evade all of the things that we try to give to patients to either control it or to kill it. Um, HIV has been uh, area of focus at uh, CFE, and, has, and CFE has been a world's leader in uh, prevention and treatment of HIV. And we're delighted to have Sabrina talk to us about HIV and what the prospects, the future prospects, are for cure of HIV. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Don, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. It's a delight to be here. It's been about 10 years since I gave Grand Rounds, so I made a different talk this time. Um, we have uh, more slides next year. <laughs> I'm happy to be back. I'll have to do more research. So as Don mentioned, I've just uh, taken up a new position at the BC Centre for Excellence in HIV-AIDS. My predecessor's uh, name was Dr. Richard Harrigan, uh, and he was the head of the laboratory that performs some of the precision medicine tests that are used to guide HIV treatment today. Uh, and those are the genotypic resistance tests, as well as the test for HLA B57 carriage, which is needed to make sure it's safe for uh, uh, people who have HIV for them to go on a drug called Abacavir. Uh, we all, the lab also performs a drug level monitoring and pharmacokinetic testing for people to adjust dosing of antiretroviral agents. Our lab does not perform the viral load testing. That's performed across the hallway in the, in the virology lab uh, headed by Chris Lowe. Um, Today, however, I'm not going to be talking about genotypic resistance in HIV, but rather I thought that I would be, uh, I, I thought that I would give an overview of what's going on in the field with respect to our efforts to cure HIV. 
So I'm going to give a general overview of where we're at. And if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that's going on in the area of HIV cure at the Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS. But if I don't have time, then we'll just skip that part because the important stuff is up front. So this is the main message. Okay, So you can fall asleep after this. There's no cure for HIV. I can't tell you where, when there's going to be one. Um, all I can tell you is that we're actively working on it, and HIV biomedica and clinical cure research is the number one area in HIV research today. And everyone agrees that in order to get there, it's going to be an international initiative where scientists, communities, and healthcare providers are going to have to work together to figure out uh, the path moving forward. That's really the main message. Um, my talk has three parts. First, I have, I'm going to go a little bit into the very basics of HIV biology and explain latency, and this is probably going to be a review for everyone, but it's just the necessary biology to understand what's, uh, what's next. Uh, the major part of the talk is I'm going to give a broad overview of all the strategies that we are considering to try to eradicate HIV and where we're at in the biomedical and clinical pipeline in achieving those strategies or at least evaluating them. And if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about the research that we're doing at the center. So here is a very, very simplified cartoon of the life cycle of HIV. HIV first uh, needs to attach to the CD4 receptor on the surface of the uh, CD4 positive T cell. Co-receptor is needed to facilitate viral entry. After that, the virus reverse transcribes its genome from RNA into DNA. After that, the DNA copy of the viral genome is irreversibly physically integrated into the genome of the host cell. And after that, the cell usually turns into a virus factory, produces more virions, and as a result of that process, either usually dies as a result of that process, or hopefully your, the immune system, uh, the, the, the cellular immune system will recognize that this is happening and eliminate this cell. So if this happened in every single case when a virus infected a cell in the body, we would have figured out how to cure HIV already. We would have already achieved that by keeping people on sustained antiretroviral treatment for a period of time, and we would just then have to wait. However, in a very small number of cases, what happens is the virus will go through the first half of this life cycle all the way to integration of its genome into the host cell, and then will fail, at least immediately, to go through the back half of the life cycle. So what we have are a small number of these persistently, latently infected cells. These cells that harbor an integrated copy of replication-competent HIV inside them, but who are deciding, at least for the moment, not to go through the rest of the life cycle. Um, the problem with these cells is that they can reactivate at any time to produce infectious HIV, and the time between now and reactivation can be decades, okay? So these cells, we refer to them as latently infected cells. We also refer to them as viral reservoirs. Resting CD4-positive T cells are the most important cell type that does this. ARTs, so antiretroviral treatments, can do nothing to touch a latently infected cell. That is because all the antiretroviral drugs act by blocking an active step in the virus life cycle. For example, reverse transcriptase inhibitors block the activity of reverse transcriptase. Integrase inhibitors block integration, right? But there ain't nothing happening that's active in a latently infected cell, so ARVs do nothing. The immune system also can do nothing because these cells are invisible to the immune system because they're not producing any viral proteins, not alerting the immune system. So, the existence of these cells are why we can't cure HIV, okay? Uh, and they can persist for decades, and as I mentioned, for reasons that we don't completely understand, they can decide to reactivate many decades later and make more viruses, and this is the reason why we have to keep uh, individuals with HIV on antiretroviral treatment for life. So I will also go through, so that's what's going on at the cellular level. Now I'll transition to what is going on at sort of the, the individual level. So we know now that in the majority of cases of sexually acquired HIV transmission, it's actually only one 
virus particle that initiates productive infection in the new host. That's not to say when HIV is transmitted, only one virus gets transmitted. Probably a bunch of them do. But on average, only one of those initiates the new infection. That's what we call the transmitted founder virus. And that begins to replicate in the new host. But what happens is viruses, the, the transmitted founder virus mutates. So mutations arise. That's why the virus color is changing. And the mutations are usually mutations that allow the virus to adapt to that host. But what I'm trying to show here, during active virus replication, what we're having is an active turnover of the viral population where descendants of the original founder virus continually evolve and replace what was there before. So there's this dynamic replacement of the transmitted founder virus with more divergent descendants thereof. This is what's going on during active viremia when the person is not treated. Underneath this process, however, is a second process that's occurring, and this is what's relevant to HIV cure. Starting probably hours within infection, from infection, some of these viruses that are circulating will infect cells, go all the way to integration, and then those cells will decide to just sit there and you know, become latent. So what happens is these viruses that are evolving within host get archived into the reservoir individually, and then they have the capacity to persist there for decades, such that if someone goes on antiretroviral therapy, that's what's shown here on the y-axis is the viremia in blood, on the x-axis is time, and what I'm showing is a cartoon of an individual who was infected with HIV, spent some amount of time without therapy, the virus is evolving during that time, we put the person on antiretroviral therapy. Viremia goes down to undetectable levels, so there's nothing going on up top anymore. But underneath, everything that was archived in the reservoir during that active viremia time has the capacity to still persist potentially for decades. OK? Um, so this happens. So even during long-term ART, there are these kind of hibernating virus strains that are there, such that if you take the person off ART, we will have inevitably viral rebound, and what will come out is you know, the stuff that's been archived in the reservoir. Okay? So this is why ART does not cure HIV. Actually, I'm going to take a step back. If I have time at the end of the talk, I'll come back to this. It's actually a slightly more complicated than this. So here, scenario one, this is the scenario where the reservoir, the latent HIV reservoir in a given individual, serves as kind of an archive of everything that's ever evolved in that person. We actually don't even know if that's entirely true because over time, it is possible, for example, that something more like scenario two is happening. So sorry, to take a step back, scenario one is if we sample an individual's latent viral reservoir after about, say, 10 years of suppressive antiretroviral mm -hmm. therapy, does that person's latent reservoir recapitulate, archived the history of HIV evolution in that individual? Or, in some people, even during ART, well, we know that there's these dynamic processes that occur. So, for example, some original latent lineages, like that blue one up top, might persist for some amount of time, but then maybe be eliminated, spontaneously reactivated and eliminated. Um, so some lineages might die out over time, whereas others, like that bright pink one, might persist through homeostatic proliferation of that cell. So right, CD4 positive T cells renew themselves through dividing. Right? So this process of natural process of homeostatic proliferation, where CD4 cells will divide to make sure that the lineage continues, that will sustain some lineages. And other times, some lineages, some HIV, some latently infected T cells might encounter their cognate antigen and proliferate. So we'll have clonal expansion of some lineages. So if this happens, what we will see after 10 years of suppressive therapy, for example, is a biased representation of the history of evolution in that person. And one of the fundamental questions that we're trying to answer in the field of HIV, right, because if we want to cure HIV, we got to get rid of the latent reservoir. And one of the basic fundamental questions is, what does that even look like after 10 or 20 years of suppressive therapy? And does that differ between people? And if so, why and how? To what extent? OK, so that was all the biology. Now I'm going to give an overview of where we're at in strategies to try to cure HIV. 
The first thing I have to do is clear up some nomenclature because it's super confusing. So usually when you hear the word cure, it means someone who previously had some kind of infection or condition and now they don't have it anymore. Okay, so in HIV, we're kind of using the word cure in two ways. One is in the true sense. The true sense of cure where somebody who was previously HIV positive is now HIV negative. They do not have HIV anymore. We're using the word sterilizing cure uh, to talk about that. We are very, very, very far away from achieving a sterilizing cure for HIV. Okay? The other type of cure that we're talking about is something that we're calling functional cure, or we're trying to stop calling it that because it's confusing. We're trying to call it HIV remission. And that is a state where somebody who has HIV might hopefully be able to discontinue their antiretroviral therapy, ideally forever, or at least for some prolonged period, without the risk of viremia rebounding uh, within them. So these people will still be HIV positive because they will still have HIV copies of the genome somewhere in their body in these latent reservoirs, but hopefully these reservoirs will be, you know, uh, not active and not run the risk of reactivating. Um, so we're, we're calling this uh, functional cure, or we're actually trying to call it HIV remission. But this is a state where somebody will not have to take antiretroviral therapy uh, for some prolonged time. They might have to come in to have some kind of intervention or procedure at some intervals, but hopefully it's not going to be a pill a day, uh, because otherwise it's kind of pointless. Um, so this is what we're talking about. These are the two things that we're, we're a little bit closer maybe to having something that looks like functional cure, but I still wouldn't be able to give a timeline on that. Now, what is our success so far in curing people from HIV? Well, there are about 37 million people worldwide living with HIV. How many people have we achieved some kind of state of remission? Maybe about 100. Okay, so... Uh, with the clarifier that we are not sure how we've achieved that. So it's come to our attention in the last few years that there are a very, very, very small number of people who generally were treated extremely early in their infection and after many years of ART, for whatever reason, decided to discontinue their medications and to the great surprise of the clinicians, viremia did not rebound right away. In fact, some people still remain uh, without active viremia in their blood. They still have HIV, um, but for their, we're calling these special group of people post-treatment controllers. So this is actually a state of HIV remission. The, the caveat here is that we actually don't understand how it works. So we're documenting cases of this rare phenotype, and we're trying to understand what leads to this phenotype happening in a very, very rare number of people who are treated early. How many cases of sterilizing cure have we achieved? One. We have cured one individual of HIV infection. His name is Timothy Brown. Um, he is also called the Berlin patient because he received treatment in Berlin. He's an American citizen. He was cured via a, a, a bone marrow transplant. So the story was he, he was HIV positive, he developed acute myeloid leukemia, he was going to die of the leukemia unless he received a bone marrow transplant, and the transplantation physicians uh, who were in Berlin at the time, because that's where this guy was living, said, ah, actually, why don't we try to find a donor who's not only an MHC match, but also who harbors this extremely rare mutation called the CCR5 Delta 32 Delta 32 mutation. It's a mutation in the co-receptor that's needed for virus entry. Why don't we try to find a donor who's homozygous for that rare mutation because those people are resistant to HIV and then we can give this guy a bone marrow transplant, cure his leukemia, and cure his HIV too. Let's try. Uh, they did. The, the, the individual uh, survived the procedure. Um, we have never, ever replicated this ever again, even though other uh, patients have undergone the procedure. Obviously, so the caveat here is that we achieved it once. We don't know how. Um, and... Uh, that uh, it's also not sustainable, obviously. We're not going to cure 37 million people by giving them all bone marrow transplants. And the, you would know better than I, but I understand that the fatality rate from these types of procedures is around about 50%. So we're not going to eradicate HIV through this method, but there is one individual who we believe actually has been cured. As an aside, we are trying to invite this individual 
uh, for a lecture sometime in fall 2019. He's quite a famous person. Um, and I, he gives a lot of public lectures. So if we succeed in doing this in partnership with the center, I'll, I'll let everyone know because he's a pretty interesting guy. Um, that was an aside. OK, so there are a number of clinical trials that um, are being uh, that are ongoing uh, to test some of the strategies that I'm going to talk about. There's some challenges uh, with these trials. The challenges are that these trials are really, really small. Um, many of them don't even have a control arm, so it's difficult to conclude whether the intervention worked, especially given our new understanding that there's this rare number of these post-treatment controllers that just naturally exist. So without a control arm, it's not really possible for you to say that your intervention actually did anything. And because of the types of procedures that are these people are undergoing as part of these trials, you can't sometimes randomize and you can't blind because it's very obvious what procedure you're undergoing. Um, the other problem is there's a lack of an agreement of how we call something a success. Okay, so at this point, we're not curing anybody. So what do we use as our benchmark for success? Um, okay, well, why don't we measure the reservoir size, right, at, before and after? Well, problem is, the, we haven't decided what the best assays are yet for measuring reservoir size. Everybody has their own assay, and everybody thinks it's the best, and there's no agreement for which assay we should use. Well, the other issue is uh, even if we decided on an assay, well, our body is pretty big, and usually what we do is we sample a little bit of what's going on in blood, but that may or may not be representative of HIV in the whole body, so sampling is a problem. Um, there's ethical concerns, right? And so the, one of the ways that we can figure out if some intervention worked is to take people off therapy and wait for their viremia to rebound. But there are safety and ethical concerns regarding that and acceptability concerns regarding that. Um, and even if we do have a uh, controlled treatment interruption as part of the trial, there is a lack of an agreement for how long you have to let that go before you can actually have useful information to see if your intervention actually works. So we're in a very, very early, there are clinical trials going on, um, but we're in early stages of evaluating um, their, the success. So there are, uh, there are many different ways to class, classify the different strategies for achieving, hopefully, an HIV cure. And this is the way I've classified them, but there's different ways to classify them. So I've divided them into four parts, and I'll talk about each of the four parts. So one strategy is to try to just reactivate all the reservoirs. Okay, so administer some kind of stimulus that will have all these latently infected cells wake up so that we can come in with some other strategy that will get rid of them. Okay, so that's a kind of general class of strategies, wake them up. Um, the second thing, usually in partnership with the first, is strategies to reinvigorate or re-engineer or do something to boost uh, human immune responses against HIV so that our own immune responses will uh, uh, be able to eliminate those reactivated reservoirs better. And there are a bunch of different immunotherapeutic strategies. Many of the ideas are borrowed from cancer that we're trying. Another strategy, you know, we're not going to achieve a sterilizing cure this way, but perhaps a functional cure, is the exact opposite. Can we design strategies that will permanently deactivate latent reservoirs such that even if they do happen to receive some kind of strong stimulus, that they will remain silent. So just damp, dampen the risk that anyone's reservoirs will ever reactivate. Just keep them quiet. Can we do that? It's one strategy that's being proposed. And uh, gene therapy and gene editing. So strategies, genetic engineering to deliver uh, the genetic engineering approaches that will actually physically cut out the HIV provirus from infected cells or and or to engineer somebody's immune cells to be res genetically resistant to HIV. These strategies are being actively pursued, including in clinical trials. So the first thing that I want to talk about is something called the shock and kill approach, which combines strategies to reactivate the reservoirs with strategies to help your immune system kill them. Okay, so combined, this is called shock and kill. Um, this is broadly the first half of the strategy here. This is all I'm going to say about the shock. These are just, we're looking actively for agents that will tickle, like reactivate latent 
latently HIV-infected cells basically wake them up so they begin to transcribe and to translate viral proteins and thus become susceptible to immune recognition. There are a variety of different compounds that are being used to try to do this. These are all from innate immune uh, response agonists, stuff like uh, chromatin remodeling agents, so agents that will physically reopen chromatin to make it more transcriptionally active, uh, chemokines, a chemokine therapy, PKC agonists. There's a variety of different strategies that are being pursued. Generally, they don't work very well, and they're really toxic. Uh, we're trying to, therefore, put them in combination, but we'll, we'll kind of see how this goes. So the shock is something that's actively being pursued, but so far, nothing has really come uh, really close to being, being used in the clinic. But first, the shock. And then some kind of immune uh, strategy to help the immune system recognize these cells that have just woken up. And this is the kill part, and there's a variety of immunotherapies being evaluated, therapeutic vaccines, checkpoint blockade, engineering chimeric antigen receptors on T cells, and antibody therapy. And I'll go through each of those on one slide each uh, now. So this is the broad approach, shock and kill, reactivate the immune system and come in with some immunotherapy to mop it up. Um, and here, you know, we'd probably administer these treatments multiple times in series while ART is still ongoing. And then hopefully by then we would have reduced or eliminated the reservoir. But that's just in theory. So what are we thinking of on the immune side? Well, the first, therapeutic vaccines. Okay, these are vaccines that will help stimulate cellular immune responses to HIV that would have been pre-existing in that individual, but just to kind of re-stimulate them so that when these latently infected cells reactivate, the cellular immune response is there to, to come kill those uh, latently infected cells that have just reactivated. Um, excellent concept. None of them have really worked so far. Immune checkpoint blockade. Okay, so in many chronic viral infections and other conditions where the immune response is constantly fighting the same pathogen for years and years and years, immune cells become exhausted and dysfunctional from, from doing this. And when that happens, immune cells begin to express certain molecules that basically show the level that they are exhausted. So PD-1, uh, CTLA-4 are different uh, kinds of these molecules that physically exhausted immune cells will express. And when you get an exhausted immune cell expressing one of, these, uh, one of these receptors, even if you present them with an HIV infected cell that is their specificity, they will fail to be able to do anything. However, we have learned from the cancer field that you can reinvigorate these immune cells by delivering antibody therapy, by delivering an antibody will, that will recognize the exhaustion marker that will reinvigorate these immune cells to be able to kill their specific targets. This is actively being pursued, actually, in, in, both, in cancer, um, as well as, in this case, in, in HIV. Okay, so this is antibody therapy to re reverse immune exhaustion. Another thing that is uh, actively um, being pursued is this idea that we could engineer T cells. The idea here is that we want to try to harness T cells whose specificity wouldn't normally be anti-HIV, but to harness them to kill HIV anyways. Um, and the way we're doing that is by trying to engineer T cells to express what we call a chimeric antigen receptor that has some features of an antibody and some features of a T cell receptor. See, in this particular example, this T CD, this killer T cell is being engineered with a receptor uh, where the active part of the receptor is an antibody that recognizes HIV envelope. That's because if a cell is reactivating from latency, they will start to make HIV proteins, including envelope. These proteins will start to assemble at the cell surface. So a cell will have virus proteins on its surface. And a T cell that has been engineered to express an antibody specific to the virus envelope, right? that's a way to have T cells that wouldn't normally recognize HIV recognize an HIV-infected cell, and then the T cell can do its killing thing. Um, these are in the 
in vitro. That's the stage that, uh, that they, they, these are at. But it's a strategy that's actively being pursued. Uh, finally, and what is in the immune cells anyways, um, the most promising strategy right now is harnessing antibodies against HIV. And just a little primer about antibodies. Uh, antibodies do two major things. The first is that antibody- some antibodies are actually physically capable of neutralizing pathogens, so coating the pathogen uh, such that the pathogen can no longer infect a cell. Not all antibodies do that. Only the neutralizing kind do that. There are some types of antibodies that are non-neutralizing, means they will adhere to the pathogen. They won't stop the pathogen from being infectious. However, these antibodies will serve as a tag that will attract immune effector cells that will then kill uh, the pathogen of interest or cells expressing uh, virus particles uh, through a process called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. However, the best kind of antibody that everyone is in love with uh, in the field of HIV now is something called a broadly neutralizing antibody. Uh, an antibody will do the, the top thing to, to actually physically neutralize pathogens, and broadly neutralizing antibodies are even more special because these are antibodies that are capable of, of uh, uh, neutralizing an extremely broad and genetically diverse range of HIV isolates because, as we all know, HIV is an extremely genetically diverse pathogen worldwide. So we are trying to harness the power of broadly neutralizing antibodies for a preventive vaccine as well as in the context of HIV cure. And just so you know, in the the hottest news in HIV cure in the past year is studies that have used passive infusion of broadly neutralizing antibodies, because we don't know how to actually elicit them by vaccination, but nevertheless, we can deliver them passively. And these have shown the ability to clear viremia in the blood, uh, and also when administered during... Um, suppressive antiretroviral therapy to significantly delay viral rebound once you take antiretroviral therapy away. So everyone loves antibodies um, at the moment. So this is my last slide on shock and kill. This is just kind of summarizing the very limited successes so far. So three of the studies that have been very prominent in this area in the last two years basically haven't worked Okay, and they were also suffering from some limitations. So, for example, BCNO2 um, was combined romadepsin, which is a chromatin remodeling agent, with a therapeutic vaccine. Then they took people off antiretroviral therapy. Only half of the participants rebounded, which is promising. But there is no control group. So it's difficult to conclude. So it's, it's hopeful. But then there was no control group, so this is why the successes, some of the successes, uh, are limited. In other, in other cases, there was really no difference, you know, in DNA before and after or between the groups that are being compared. However, there was one particular study, which was performed in a monkey model of HIV, where they combined an immune, uh, an, an innate immune agonist, a TLR7, um, with a broadly neutralizing antibody. And they saw that after they took the monkeys off therapy, a significant number of them continued to control viremia completely in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. So a lot of people's attention are turning into shock and kill approaches that actually use broadly neutralizing antibodies instead of cellular uh, strategies to focus on the cellular immune response. Okay, I just have one slide on this very interesting strategy, the opposite strategy. Well why don't we just keep these reservoirs silent permanently, okay? This strategy has not made it to the clinic yet, but there's a prominent group at the Scripps Institute that have uh, discovered and are characterizing a lead compound called didahydrocortostatin A, DCA. Uh, They have have shown in cell line models as well as um, mouse models of HIV that this compound will suppress the activity of latent reservoirs so that even if you come in with a strong stimulus later, the reservoirs stay silent. So this will not ever be used to achieve a sterilizing cure for HIV, but maybe we'll get to the point where we'll have something that will keep these reservoirs silent so that people can go off antiretroviral therapy without the risk of viral rebound. But this is not in clinical trials yet. 
Finally, strategies, so gene, genome editing strategies, okay? So the first is, why don't we cut out the genome, okay? Why don't we have some strategy that goes into your cells and just cuts out the HIV genome and then we're good? Um, we've done it in a cell line, okay? So we've cured a cell line of HIV, um, and in an experimental animal model, we've been able to do that too, okay? So small human safety studies, conceptually have been approved by the NIH. Um, so they're in the stage of maybe we'll see this in the next couple of years, studies to try to do this in vivo in humans. Um, but, you know, it sounds like I never thought that we would see this, but uh, uh, it looks like in the next couple of years we might, have, I might actually have trials. The other gene therapy way is actually to engineer human cells. Can we engineer our lymphocytes to be genetically resistant to HIV by knocking out the gene for CCR5. CCR5, uh, sorry, I should have said this earlier. In order for HIV to enter a cell, you need two receptors, CD4 and then one other one. And the other one is usually CCR5, chemokine receptor uh, 5, or it could be another one called CXCR4, but CCR5 is the primary one. There are humans who are genetically uh, resistant to most strains of HIV because they have this naturally occurring mutation in CCR5 so that they don't make the receptor. So that was the inspiration to have gene editing strategies where we knock out CCR5. So the way these work is that um, the lymphocytes, the, the participant leukapheresis would happen, the lymphocytes would be extracted from the person, they would be engineered in vitro to be genetically resistant to CCR5 using the old school zinc finger nuclease uh, strategy because CRISPR hadn't come online, CRISPR-Cas hadn't come online at the time that they were evaluating this. Then you put them back, okay? And a clinical trial ran and was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. The initial trial, you know, successfully edited, you know, between five and 10% of the lymphocytes, so not anywhere near what you would need to achieve to render somebody resistant to HIV, but nevertheless, there's, uh, they're optimizing their approaches to achieve higher percentages of editing, okay? So this is about, this started in the last decade and the clinical trial was, first clinical trial was published already five years ago and they're, they're still working on it. Um, there's a couple of things, however, in the latent HIV literature in the past year that have turned out to be unfortunately wrong. So big studies that were hailed as breakthroughs uh, and they're just probably not right. So because I'm here, I'll just let you know in case you saw some of these high-profile studies. Last year in science, there was a group that claimed, finally, that they have found a physical marker on the outside of latently infected cells that we could somehow use to mark the latent reservoir. Because one of the problems that we have, there's not many of these cells. They don't express anything that lets you know that they're latently infected. So we've been, you know, the holy grail is to find some kind of marker that marks them as the latent reservoir. And in 2017, a French group said that they had um, identified that as CD32A, which is kind of weird because that's like a B cell marker. I feel it kind of went, really? CD32A? Um, turns out it was a technical artifact, a completely understandable one, and three papers were back-to-back -back published last month in Nature, basically saying, ah, sorry, uh, it was a, we, we, we screwed up. So CD32A does not mark the latent reservoir, so if you had heard that recently, it's, we, we don't have a marker of the latent reservoir anymore. The other thing that recently, in the last few years, this study came out. Um, there, was, there was a group uh, led at the NIH that showed in a monkey model of HIV, if you um, uh, treated with anti-alpha-4, beta-7 antibody therapy, um, that they could basically cure monkeys of HIV. Nobody understood how it worked, but what they achieved was phenomenal. It was published in Science. Then NIH moved forward very quickly to do a trial in humans but then also decided that maybe they should try to replicate this experiment, but they did it at the same time because they just, because this, the, the, the data were out, kind of outstanding uh, in this paper. But unfortunately, they tried to replicate the study in monkeys and could not. And in parallel, they initiated a trial in humans and it didn't work. So there's still 
a lot of active research in this area because they're trying to figure out why the original 2016, because those monkeys still don't have SIV, so they're trying to figure out what the difference was between the 2016 study and the 2018 study. So we might see more in this area, but we're not going to see anti-alpha-4 beta-7 treatment to eradicate HIV anytime soon. Um, and then this is my last slide on before the, well, the first part, and we can decide whether we want to hear about a little bit of research. But we don't know how we're going to cure HIV. We don't have a timeline on this yet. And I can tell you it's not going to be a pill that you take and then, you know, you're not going to have HIV anymore. It is much, much, much more likely that it's going to be a, a series of interventions that are likely going to happen in combination or perhaps in series where some of them might actually even be personalized selection based on your profile. So what might something like that look like? Here's something that is kind of a cartoon. But how are we going to eradicate HIV? Well, start antiretroviral therapy as early as possible. We're not going to eradicate HIV by doing that, but the earlier you start, the smaller and the less diverse your reservoir will be, and that will hopefully make it easier to get rid of the reservoir. Okay, so early ART. Um, perhaps shock and kill, so something to reactivate reservoirs and try to eliminate them. It's not going to ever get rid of all your reservoirs. So what do you do after that? Genetic engineering to render the rest of your cells resistant to HIV. And after that, anything that's left, if there's anything left that you can't shock and kill and get rid of, block it with the block and lock strategies. Maybe that's a way that we'll get to the point that we will achieve functional cure, oh, a state where somebody would discontinue antiretroviral therapy without the, the, the risk of viral rebound. But this is in theory, but it's to illustrate the potential complexity and personalized nature of what a cure might look like. So where we're at, uh, we don't have a cure, but we think it's possible and we're working on it. It's unlikely to be a one-size-fits-all approach. It is likely to be you know, highly personalized. Uh, and, but in order to get to that goal, we're actively working uh, together with our patient populations and um, our community partners and care providers and physicians such as yourselves uh, to help guide us as to what's feasible, what's acceptable, what's worthwhile pursuing, and what's absolutely not. Because as I said, we're not going to give everyone bone marrow transplants. Um, and that's, this, is, uh, this is the end of the... Oh, sorry. The last thing, that, so to convince you uh, <laughs> that we're actively working on HIV cure and we think it's feasible uh, for this part of the, uh, the talk, I wanted to end on uh, this following quote by Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is the head of NIAID at the NIH, and he gave this in his keynote lecture last month at the NIH Cure Strategies. And he's basically saying, look, we don't know how to do it yet, but we really do think HIV remission is feasible with that. He was like, keep working on it. Uh, and that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so there's a movement now. We don't know how we're going to do it, uh, but we do think it, it will, be, will be possible eventually. Um, shall I? You have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Yeah, this, this part is 10 minutes, but I'm, it might be better to, I can talk for another 10 minutes or I can stop and answer questions. Go ahead. OK. Okay, this is a 10-minute talk that I gave. This is a research. So we're doing a bunch of cure research at the, at the center, um, and this is just some of it. Most of the research that we're doing in the field of HIV cure is uh, sort of uh, around the genetics, the genetics of the latent reservoir. So just as you remember, during active replication, we have this dynamic turnover of descendants of the original founder virus. This is what it looks like as a cartoon. This is what it looks like as real data, okay? So here are HIV sequences sampled from a single individual over the course of more than 10 years without antiretroviral therapy. The transmitted founder virus is at the top, this tiny little root. Um, and over time, we see that the branches of the tree become progressively more distant from the original founder virus. And if you color all the branches by time, you see this beautiful rainbow, okay? And that is the turnover of the viral population, okay? But what's going on in the reservoir is totally different, right? We get this archiving and persistence of everything that's ever happened. Or do we? Okay, because this is actually one of the fundamental questions. If you look at the ARV, if you look at the viral reservoir after, say, a decade on ART, does it recapitulate the history of evolution in that person still? Or 
is it kind of skewed because of these dynamic processes like homeostatic proliferation, lineage extinction, clonal expansion, all that kind of stuff? Is this happening? Or is it a bit of both? Or does it differ depending on the person? So this is one of the questions that we're trying to answer. Easy question, but in order to answer it, you have to be able to sample the reservoir after 10 or 20 years on ART, and you have to con contextualize that information in context of the full history of HIV evolution that occurred before the person went on therapy. So conceptually, that's really easy, but there are not so many places in the world where we've kept the samples so that we can do that. In fact, there are very, very few places in the world that you can even do that. One of the places, however, is here. Because in British Columbia, viral load testing for HIV has been done since 1996. And the residual material from all viral load tests that have ever been performed since 1996 have been kept for clinical reasons. This is in case the test fails so they can go back and do it again. Or because treating physicians that treat HIV uh, patients in British Columbia can order resistance tests on archived remnants of samples that have previously been tested for viral loads. For example, if you want to know what the resistance genotype was of somebody five years ago, you can order that test and we can do it if there's samples remaining. My predecessor, Dr. Richard Harrigan, set up a protocol, a research protocol, that asked participants to consent to allow us to use any residual specimens that might be still remaining from whatever clinical tests had been performed for the purposes of understanding HIV better, so for, for, the, per, per, pros, uh, for the purposes of research. So there have been a number of participants who have allowed us to go back into the archives and study the history of their virus evolution in their way. So we've developed a new tool in HIV research, and this is a phylogenetic method that allows us to figure out how old a specific reservoir sequence is. Okay, so I have to go into a little bit of phylogenetics. This is the approach. This is not data, this is just a cartoon. So here we have an individual. On the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is viral load, and we sample their virus at various points before they go on therapy. And then they go on therapy, the viral load is undetectable, and then we can sample their reservoir many years later after that. And when, we, when I say sample their reservoir and sample their viral load history, we use this, a technique called single genome amplification, where we take the biological material, dilute it down so there's only a single copy of HIV in every PCR reaction, and we get dozens of sequences, each that have been obtained from a single template. It's very laborious. But if the reservoir is truly an archive of within-host evolution that happened before, what the data should look like is that when we reconstruct the history of virus evolution in that patient, the sequences that we get out of the reservoir, the ones in the diamonds, should be genetically diverse and intersperse through the whole phylogenetic history of that participant before they went on therapy. And that's what this cartoon is showing. This is what we should see if the reservoir is truly an unbiased genetic archive of what had happened. And then we want to know not only that, but how old are these, uh, how old are these uh, individual reservoir sequences? How old are these sequences in the diamonds? Well, what we do is we can fit a linear model, a regression line, okay, that relates for each of the plasma HIV sequences sampled prior to the start of therapy, we graph them. We graph the year that they were collected versus the distance from the transmitted founder virus. And we draw a line through those dots, and that line represents the rate of HIV evolution in that person before they went on therapy. And with that line, we can convert genetic distance to time. So each of these unknown sequences in the diamonds, we measure their genetic distance from the root, and then we relate that to figure out how old those sequences are. So for example, we sampled a whole bunch of sequences in year seven, and the top one up there, which is 0.09 substitutions per nucleotide site distance from the founder, that's actually three years old. This one down here, that dates to a year before the patient walked into our clinic. Okay, so this is the method that we've used to date individual sequences in the reservoir. So we use HIV sequences sampled before the start of therapy. We use this to fit a linear model that relates genetic distance from the root to time. And then we use this to date 
every single latent sequence in the person's body. Here is a, I'll just show two patient examples. Here was one individual who spent some time with no therapy, then spent some time on incompletely suppressive dual therapy, I don't know why, then went on triple therapy, controlled for quite a while, after that had some viremia blips, but we sampled the reservoir at two places in 2016, so two years ago in the summer is DNA, and in 2013, during this big viremia blip to about 1,000 copies, we sampled the viruses that came out during that blip under the hypothesis that that was spontaneous reactivation of the reservoir, a big one. And we used the sequences before triple therapy uh, to make the phylogeny. So this is the host-specific phylogeny, reconstructing the history of evolution in this individual, where the root is the transmitted founder virus. You can see a massive genetic bottleneck that is coincident with starting dual therapy. But if you can see all of the uh, open symbols that are sampled from the reservoir, they are interspersed throughout the entire phylogeny, including a clade that is very close to the root, meaning these sequences that were sampled in 2016 and 2012 are dating to about 20 years earlier and everywhere in between. We need to fit two regression lines for this patient because there were two kind of eras of evolutionary history, but we can transform this information into a histogram of the ages or the birthdays of the reservoirs sampled in 2016. So all of these sequences were sampled in either 2013 or 2016, and the oldest are dating to 1994. So we have reservoirs spanning a 20-year age range for this person. Some people look like this. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to skip these two slides because this is just showing the same data. Some other participants look a little bit different. Okay, so in everyone we find old sequences, but in this particular participant, the majority of sequences date to the couple of years before they started ART, and it's a little bit difficult to find older sequences. They're there. So in some cases, it's biased uh, towards the reservoir being a little bit younger, and in our hands, everyone is a little tiny bit different. So in conclusion, we've developed a bunch of tools. Some of them are phylogenetic tools to really, at a granular level, understand within host evolutionary dynamics, including this tool that will allow us to date individual virus sequences within host. We hope to use this tool to answer a variety of questions, like when we have these viremia blips on otherwise suppressive therapy. You know, what is that? Is that old sequences coming from the reservoir? What about if somebody discontinues therapy? How old are the viruses that come out after viremia rebounds in blood, and the age-old question during suppressive therapy, is there still evolution of HIV going on? We can use this tool to try to get at that question as well. So this is it. We've been developed a method to study the viral reservoir. We've applied it to many people. Everybody is different. Um, but yeah, the reservoir is an archive of virus evolutionary history, uh, and we think we are developing tools that will help us answer fundamental questions in latency biology, which will bring us closer to an HIV cure eventually. And the most important slide. <laughs> this is the study team. Bruce actually is in the audience. So, uh, But most of all, we have to thank the very generous participants of our studies, as well as our clinician, uh, phlebotomy, and other team members who are helping us um, recruit people for study um, and for their, for their efforts and time. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Beautiful presentation. Uh, before we get to Q&As, I'd just like to um, announce next week's talk. I will be given by Dr. Lowe from uh, Geriatric Medicine on providing medical care to fellow clinicians and their families. So come back next week. So we'll open up the floor for Q&As. Peter? Uh, great talk, Sabrina. Um, two questions. One is, is there a um, what's the relationship, if any, between natural That is an excellent question and one that is being fiercely debated because some people believe that perhaps there are two sides of the same phenotype and other people who believe that they are very, very, very different. And the crux of it is 
what is the mechanism of this control? We don't know. Um, and but So because we don't understand the mechanism of control, we can't say that these are two sides of the same phenotype or very different. Um, so I, I can't really answer that question other than people who have spent a long time studying elite control think that it's a, still important to study elite controllers because they will be perhaps the easiest to cure and perhaps will give us insight on natural immune control. Um, but um, I don't know. I don't think they're the same thing because there's a very strong basis for elite control. It's a very strong basis for host immune mediated mechanisms of elite control. So if you're a elite controller, you're usually you're, you're B, HLA B57 and B27 and other aspects of the cellular immune response significantly play a role in elite control. Host treatment control, HLA type doesn't seem to matter. So that suggests that they're different. And post treatment control, the biggest predictor of whether you're going to become post treatment controller is when you started therapy. Therapy has nothing to do with whether you will go on to become an elite controller or not. Some elite controllers got therapy. Um, the other, this is tangential to your question, but the other thing that, we're, that people are realizing is actually to be a post treatment controller, you need to have started treatment early, but not too early. If you start it too early, what people are finding is that if you start therapy way, way early and then you take people off therapy, the rate of rebound is astoundingly fast and the rebound sometimes is even higher than you would expect in completely uncontrolled infection. It's People are kind of thinking now that post-treatment control has something to do with having the immune response interact with the smaller amounts of virus for a short amount of time to prime the immune response, almost to say, like, okay, I, I know what's going on, and then knock the virus down to levels before the immune response becomes fully exhausted. Whereas if you start people so early that the immune response hasn't even had time to figure out that HIV is there, then if you take those people off therapy, they rebound to ridiculous levels. Uh, but this is even not something... This is part of what was being debated a month ago at the Cure meeting, the relationship between early, early treatment and slightly earlier treatment. So I guess the long answer to your question is we don't know. <laughs> Sorry. So the second question yeah. is, uh, Sorry, before you go ahead, just a reminder to either use your microphones or if you can repeat the questions. Um, uh, but just uh, the okay. So the, the second question was why you didn't pick a less difficult career path. Uh, but I think you've answered it in the second part of your talk with those very interesting results. You've <laughs> okay, you. very good. Uh, any other questions from the floor or off-site? Yeah, go ahead. Please pr uh, press the mic in front of you. Uh, I was wondering if anything came out of the um, 2014 uh, results showing that uh, there's the pyroptosis of CD4 cells, and it's like actually abortive infection uh, of HIV of CD4 that kills 95% of, of the of our immune cells and not the virus itself and whether there's any more clinical implications of trying to block that. Yeah, so are you talking a little bit about bystander effects, CD4 cell yeah. death? So why do CD4 positive T cells seem to die off without even being infected with HIV? So that's something that's been studied for a long time. Uh, we don't have a complete answer to that yet, but it looks like there's... Infected cells secrete, well, infected cells release exosomes and other stuff that can then influence and be taken up by cells around them such that cells around them might then display properties of being infected even though that they're not. Uh, and then mechanisms like ADCC and other mechanisms can lead to bystander destruction, um, especially or pieces of the virus envelope will kind of just slough off and become attached to the surface of other infected cells, which then, if antibodies bind to that, then those cells can be eliminated by ADCC without them actually being infected. So this is active areas being pursued. Um, I have to declare, though, this specific research question is not being directly investigated by the Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS because we don't have any immunologists working on it. Working on hiring immunologists, that is not working on learning immunology myself. So when you talk about broadly neutralizing antibody, are we just talking about like IVIG therapy, like pool plasma, or ah uh, no, yeah, so specific? yeah, so 
Uh, again, I'm not an antibodyologist, but in, in a very, 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 in a minority of HIV infected people who have been living with the virus for a long time, who are not on therapy, so where the virus has been actively evolving in them, mm -hmm. in about 20% of those people, eventually their immune responses succeed in making antibodies that don't help them because their virus is always staying mm. one step ahead of them. But if those antibodies are actually capable of eliciting, uh, of neutralizing a broad range of virus isolates from around the world. So the, a great irony is that these antibodies that arise through this complex evolutionary process don't mm. help the people who make them because mm. their virus is ahead. But if somehow we could elicit these antibodies by vaccination in people who don't have HIV yet, so these antibodies were already there, they could protect against HIV acquisition, or in the case of cure, somehow we could take these antibodies and infuse them or find a way for normal people's bodies to make them, that they could be used as part of a curative strategy. Problem is we don't understand why some people make these antibodies. We don't know how to elicit them by vaccination. The only thing that we can do is purify them in massive quantities after mm -hmm. we've figured out what they are and then passively in, like infuse them. So it's Sounds not really sustainable. Yeah. yeah, it's not sustainable either. And when you talk about reservoirs, I mean, mm -hmm. all the CD4 cells have a lifespan, you know? Uh, so but then they can divide. So are you talking about really stem cell infection? So transition it that, to... That's relevant here, rather than the daughter cells? So whether stem cells get infected with HIV is still... Some people say, yeah, it's like true, like true, true, true stem cells, but uh, stem cell memory, mm -hmm. so the... Stem cell memory, CD4 positive T cells that display some stem cell memory like mm -hmm. properties, those do get infected by HIV. Um, definitely. Um, and yeah, these cells, some, the terminally differentiated, uh, throughout the naive cells can still get infected by, by HIV, but mm -hmm. less often. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the process of cell division, homeostatic yeah. division, uh, is a major. And, and clonal expansion are major mechanisms that likely contributed to the longevity of the longevity of the reservoir. Okay. Yes, because I mean, CD4 positive Different. T cells. If you have a, I, I mean, I guess for example, just say you have a flu-specific CD4 T cell, mm -hmm. but that cell gets infected with HIV and it's latently infected, and then you get the flu one year, then that T cell will expand because it's like, oh yeah, flu. But when it expands, it's going to expand with the HIV in, it, integrated genome in it. So when we look at the reservoirs of people infected with HIV, often we will get out the same sequence over and over and over and over again, um, but it's not template resampling by PCR. Like we're, limit, we're diluting each, we're diluting the genetic material down to a single template and we're getting the same template over and over again, and that's because the original latently infected cell clonally expanded into many copies and those copies are persisting for some amount of time. Mm. Interesting. Sounds like um, we're not going to get a cure anytime soon. Mm, no. Um, but tremendous progress is being made. So with that, thank you very much for a very exciting talk. Thank you. Well, it's like lots of progress. But, hey, well, uh, a lot more challenges than <laughs> <laughs> So difficult. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And, and we are learning a lot from cancer, and I think we need to next turn to other chronic diseases. So. so I don't know if you know Janice, she's a restaurant, and she runs the HIV. It's probably me. <laughs> that is. So, um, <laughs> she's been talking about tissue samples. I'm down. Yes, yes. Hi, yes. I'm here. Yes. 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 There you go. Because I, I wear, I have two jobs. Yes. One is here, and one is in the Yeah, Peter's going to be moving yes. to the center because we're moving the bike. Yes, yes. we're actually trying to figure that out because one of our therapists is going to need to figure Well, walk away and yeah. see if Peter gets certified for transportation of dangerous goods. <laughs> or if we need to engage with So, yeah. I, Peter's timeline for transition here is that he was January because okay. he wants to yeah. uh, finish off his experience. Yeah. Um, 
our lease <laughs> at, S at, at BCCC, where he currently is, yeah. is expiring at the end of March. So that's yeah. why I told Peter, finish up in January, because then if you ask me for a one month extension, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But, you know, as of April 1st, we're out on the, the street. street. So, <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Must, the Powell Street? Well, no, no, not Powell Street. So under Richard Harrigan, yeah. the biocontainment virus culture activities was ongoing at the, at the BCCC, and there was some oh, employees because you can't do virus culture. Yeah. I'm running a biocontainment lab at SFU, oh, and, okay. and for me to keep oh four laboratories open, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. running two biocontainment yeah. labs, makes no sense. Yeah. Sure. So then I said, we will scientifically consolidate, save money, mm -hmm. and I won't go crazy. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Four yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's why Peter's leaving the two. SFU, mm -hmm. but the sample transitioning, I'm sure we can figure something out either by clear, yeah, $20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just don't tell them. Like, seriously, <laughs> Peter can, yeah, I'm fine. You can certify yourself for transporting dangerous goods, and you can transport these stuff and in your car. Bus. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can't take the bus, but you can transport it in your private vehicle. Oh, I see. As long as you have the TDG in your wallet. Um, you don't have to plant in the car or anything like that, but if you've been certified to transport and you're packaged the, the, you package the materials as if the courier would, would like you package all in case mm. for regulations, and, and you can do it. Right. I used to drive between SFU and the BCCDC with my cell cultures in my car. Yeah, what happened is he's accepting our math equations for us. I didn't even know that the guys had worked out for us here. So I guess they kept on us to have to learn it. Until January. Until the CDC, but uh, after okay. that, uh, yeah. come 2019, the infections yeah. are going to happen at SFU. Yeah. So you're going to have to figure out how to get this stuff yeah. Back, yeah. Here. back here. Yeah. For yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. Peter, if, if whoever's, yeah. you could do it by career. Um, or, yeah, somebody certified for a transport of dangerous goods. No, she tell you. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. We have excellent support, like at the like SFU, the biosafety officers are great, and we'll like, figure out a way to do stuff. But yeah, prop up your career, or you know, if it's not that hard, and the delivery of your. Only half an hour. So I'm actually like, wow, that's great. Yeah, it's very tough to be Thank you, thank you for inviting me. We have found an affirmative regulation for CCR 5 and 6 and 4 on the FDRL side. So it's completely supposedly there. I don't know what happened. We don't know. And this is what we're working on. We don't know what happens to that interaction. Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe it just bothers some. That doesn't necessarily go. So that your primary research question is. Mm -hmm. Can epithelial cells of the lung be infected with HIV, and if so, is it the macrophages that are, yeah. that are doing that? That's the research question. Yeah, that's yeah. It. so. When, when yeah. Peter, Peter presented a broad overview of everything that he was doing, including that study, it went by really fast. Okay. So said, wait, 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 wait. So, what's the primary yeah. research question here? And he said, "Well, I think it's this, but right now I'm just in the we stage. We just don't know what that interaction. Is. interaction. Yeah, yeah, we don't yeah. know what that interaction is between the macrophages. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to find out." Um, I don't know enough there to know. Okay, let's get it down. Why did you start with those infections? Oh, the drive. It de-differentiates in the, so we grow the uh, lung epithelial cell cultures. Okay. And once we insert it in there, it de-differentiates. Okay, and you know in this case that, so the other question I have for Peter is, how do you know your macrophages caught HIV? Well, he, or, yeah, so I guess he's, I mean, he has graphs of the branch and like, after infection, I okay. presume that is good enough for evidence that they are actively infected. Um, but I don't know whether it actually gets infected. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it, it is possible that well, at some point, Peter and I have to introduce, like, I know people who study macrophages yeah. and yeah. HIV. Yeah. Who's at the University of Hawaii, and I'm like, grad students are all like, can I go there? Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know yeah. if at the point we need to bring in some of that expertise, then we can talk about Peter yeah. gaining that expertise. Right, right now, we're just looking at what yeah. happens to yeah. you. Yeah. Does it break down? Does it, is there any just to talk about that? Yeah. So partly, I think Peter's move to SFU hopefully will be, I think it was a win, 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 uh, because SFU does have immunologists. Yeah. It does have more biologists. Peter is now going to be showing in, in his data. He'll be more engaged with yeah. good people in general, yeah. and hopefully he'll be able to get more in yeah. on his studies. And if that's still not enough, then we can get more yeah. input from outside. Yeah. The BCC, the CDC was... Uh, I think well, a little bit challenging for Peter because the facilities yeah. are great, people yeah. are great, but he was basically working yeah. in yeah. Yeah. isolation yeah. Um, with another yeah. technician. There wasn't like an, a rich academic because yeah. yeah. the BCC yeah. was yeah. they were just going to the States. Yeah. So we're hopeful yeah. that this transition will also be yeah. academically yeah. more enriching for Peter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw the data. It's super neat. And I'm interested in bronchial alveolar lavages and yes. what are viruses. Because we've collected this for now five years. So we all talk for one second. That was the best talk ever. I usually never understand this stuff. No, I usually like never oh, really? understand. People it. look bored. No, oh, no, 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 this, was, this guy was you sleeping. Are such a good. <laughs> well, no, they, they were all on call. Oh, they do that every round. Oh, it's, it's the only time I was like, oh my god, I'm going on. Let them sleep. Let them sleep. That's what I always say to myself when I'm up here. I'm like talking louder and louder, trying to wake people up. I'm like, oh, you know what? Let them sleep. They're so tired. They're so tired. They're not Amazing. I know. I really never understand it, and that was like. Right at my level. <laughs> well, I did that on purpose. Like, I didn't want to talk about my research because then people think it's boring. So it's like, let's just talk about stuff that hopefully will no, be useful. So because then your patients are like, what, what's going on? Okay, oh. right, well, thank you. Yeah, so I have these FFU. I have brought out the lavage samples. Um, most of them are on ART. Most yeah, of yeah. Are, so yes, people on the ART. Yes. How about your match for samples? Yeah. Ah. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. So I would be so happy if there were individuals on suppressed ART, like so, so low, yeah. like undetectable yeah. virulence yeah. on ART who had matched yeah. blood. Yeah. Uh, okay, what do you, we have, because cells, you gotta get, yeah. Okay, well we have bucket coats uh, and plasma. Ah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, anything that yeah, it's not a huge numbers. number. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we have like yeah, and we can look yeah. at the genetics, yeah. diversity yeah. of the of the because if somebody yeah. suppressed yeah. on ARVs, their plasma viral load is undetectable. Mm -hmm. So you can make an excellent case to say that well, any um, HIV pro viral <laughs> copies that we can get out of cells from blood, mm -hmm. those are likely infected cells because there's mm -hmm. this supernormal virus mm -hmm. replication going on. So we can look at the genetics of that, and then we can isolate viruses from different whatever, and then we are we have an excellent phylogenetics team, and some of the research questions that we're answering is when we get latent HIV sequences from different parts of the body, do they all look like you know they're just they're all part of the same virus pool, or is there evidence for population structure, uh, genetic compartmentalization, divergent evolution? Sanctuary sites, so on. So, we, we have another branch of the research program that's looking at. Well, I mean, you can actually email address. Yeah, so, like, that would be that's what I asked Peter. So, can I study the viruses, you know, in these, you know, and, but. Um, Okay. Yeah, because I can be very happy to write an ethics protocol. I have students who would be just really excited to work on matched, compartmentalized latent reservoir samples. We're about to, we're working on a paper now where. A collaborator contributed yeah. um, testes, testicular oh. tissue. For, so <laughs> transgender women who yeah. had decided to undergo oh, the yeah. gender reassignment, yeah. Yeah, they enrolled and they, they were yeah. HIV positive, yeah. suppressed on ARTs, yeah. and they donated the yeah, tissue and a blood yeah. sample. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be the first paper. Of, like it was extremely difficult to get any HIV out of testes, but if you try really hard, you can get, you can get a few samples. Yeah. So we're basically publishing a paper saying, you know, you can find it in there, and these are the genetics. But yeah, we're really so. Well, I we ran a pilot of this with, with um, Richard Harrigan oh. a while ago, but not on very many. Oh, some we couldn't just have any yeah, yeah, yeah. HIV, and then some we did. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So yeah, we should. Okay, I I'm gonna be in touch because yeah. I would love to yeah. pick that up. Yeah. Um, and expand yeah. that. Yeah, and, and I you know tell me like how much you would need to run your assay and stuff like that, and we'll see what we. 
or for VAL? Yeah. Yeah, my answer would be, I have no clue because yeah. I've never worked on it. <laughs> yeah. But if whatever you give, I can try. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm just going to... Oh, thank you. I spent nine years teaching at SFU. Okay. And currently, with this new position, I have a break from teaching while I'm here uh, for as long as this position lasts. But, yeah, you're the head president. And the chief medical nurse. Ah. I have, and my job here is to make sure that people can hear and all, right. all this. But. Well, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. I just leave everything. You can just leave it. We'll just close the doors and make sure they're all locked up. And then okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, well, I'll follow you out. Whichever way you want to follow this chart. I'm just going to turn this. Turn it off. There we go. All right. Thank you. All. This one.
your call will be disconnected.